And uh, thanks for setting up that, that point. I hate that line of, you know, futures we can't predict because it's not true. It's actually highly predictable. And I know this because half of the work that my team do is with companies in engineering and um, uh, creative industries like television and internet companies, tech startups, fashion labels. You would never know this, but fashion labels. And most of the ideas that will influence how we work, play, live, use energy, most of them are the people behind those are actually shaping the problems, working out what the real challenges are right now. And it's quite predictable what's going to come up. It's to do these big ideas, these big things that have monumental impact, actually takes quite a lot of time. And it means that certainly the students in high school today, even by the time they have finished university, if that is where they're going, um, they'll be working on problems which uh, were shaped and found uh, today. So um, I could now stop my talk because that's more or less it. That's the purpose uh, behind it. But I'm going to try and explain a little bit more. I'm also aware, I feel bad because we've got people standing at the back. It makes me feel very loved to have people standing. There was standing room only. But there are some seats if you would like to take a seat. Don't worry about coming down here and taking a seat. I won't make any remarks. <laughs> you can come down this side as well. But there's seats here and tables there. Our team is really about helping people um, create amazing ideas, make things work in school that maybe they thought they couldn't make work. Our job is to help people think differently. And changing the way they choose to work is something quite novel for a lot of people, because most people don't choose how they work. Uh, they get told how they're going to work, and that's that. But young people actually do choose more often than not. And teaching them how to make those choices is really important. The one thing I've learned um, in now about nine years of working with uh, really successful educators and really successful people in business and not-for-profits is they are all really good at breaking or bending the rules. And I know it's something that in international schools and many schools in this part of the world, the idea of even bending the rules is anathema. It's not something that, that's easy to do. Now, what do I mean by breaking rules? Um, I do not mean this. So I'm a big football fan. That's a beautiful example. <laughs> of just breaking the rules. Look at that. Ah, beautiful. And you've got the entire Barcelona football team um, having a group injury. Look at this. And I couldn't work that one out. My favorite is the first one, though. I mean, look, just let's look at this again. One, two, three. Oh. So this is not healthy. This is breaking rules. It's bad behavior. Don't do that. But you can bend rules for, um, for good. And uh, doing that need, means that you have to have confidence in yourself to do it. Uh, this is the purpose of our team, and I, I show it because the first line is really, well, it's only one line, it's only one sentence, the first uh, little phrase. Helping people find the creative confidence to, make, to bend these rules and break them is, is tricky. It takes time. It's showing people when they are taking it too far. You've got to let people sometimes break rules in, in the footballer's kind of way before they can pull back and realize where the balance is. But doing that means that people find their place in a team. And when you know your place in a team, then you're able to make a contribution to it. And together, you create so much more. The sum of the parts is, is incredible. And in schools, we tend not to do that very well. We teach children in, in kind of homogeneous groups. They, they sit with um, very often similar socioeconomic backgrounds, they sit learning more or less the same stuff because we're, we're pumping through a curriculum. It's really hard to collaborate when you're all learning the same thing. That's just group work. That's just group work. It's not collaboration. When you collaborate, it means that you bring something special to the table that no one else is able to bring as well as you are. I'm delighted with my team because no one in my team has the whole skill set. It's a little bit like being a spy, actually. No one knows all the information. Uh, we need each other in order to produce whatever it is we do. And I like that. I think it's really important. And rules are not all bad. They're not all to be bent or broken. Some rules are really good. I'm going to show you this. This is a bit of an experiment. This might not work. We are going to, can I ask you all just to stand up, 
apologies if you've got a laptop in your knee, but put it on the floor, stand up, look out for drinks and things. I don't have insurance for that. So, well, I'm not going to ask you to dance. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to sing, okay? So, <clears throat> we're going to create the, the 21st century learning Hong Kong community choir. So, stand here in the middle, and I'm going to sing a note. My voice is a little bit, I had no microphone yesterday, and then maybe I had a glass of wine in the drunk book last night, so my throat's not what it should be. My singing is not up to scratch. I'm going to sing you one note here, and I want you to sing the same note back. And please don't take too long to sing the same note back, please. Otherwise, I'm all alone singing, and that's not a choir. Okay, so, uh, la, yeah, la, 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 Should we, should we go more? So, <laughs> la, 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 Okay. <laughs> right. Well done. Give yourselves a round of applause because it worked. Okay. Take a seat. Now I feel like a priest. <laughs> you know. Who's giving the sermon today? Oh, it's me. Um, so th what was going on? Any musicians? Any Scottish or Irish people know what was going on there? <laughs> now, the reason I say that is that what you were singing is the pentatonic scale. And I stole this from a brilliant talk that I normally use when I meet primary school children for the first time. I was a French and German teacher in high school and can't cope with small children, so I show them videos instead. And this was it. Um, so this is... a. Uh, I just turn this up a little bit. Well, it's not me. We need to turn it up a tad on the, the desk. So Bobby McFerrin, jazz genius, did the same thing. Now he's doing it with a bunch of people in America, and you kind of think, well, of course it works. Okay. <laughs> and all these guys, they're all neuroscientists, they're super smart, and they're thinking, oh, wow, our brains are incredible. They're wired for this, this thing. If you're Scottish or Irish, you know that bagpipes have always played the pentatonic scale. And that's why when, in my hometown, <laughs> in my hometown of Dunoon in the west coast of Scotland, we have the world's biggest Highland gathering, three and a half thousand pipers and drummers come together, and even when they all play different tunes together, it sounds marvellous. You do have to like bagpipes, but, but it sounds marvellous. Because the pentatonic scale, not only do all the notes when you play them together, sound really nice together, no matter which order you play them in. But also our brains are hardwired for it. And our brains are hardwired for it, no matter which culture you come from. So this is a natural rule. If you have a piece of hose pipe, you know the stuff from the, that you put in the back of a, a dishwasher or something to drain it, and spin it really fast around your head. You do that on a weekend, yes? Um, <laughs> You will get the pentatonic scale. If you go fast enough, it will go higher and higher. It's a natural tone. So rules are good for breaking. This is a German engineering company. They don't generally break rules. <laughs> don't laugh. I heard that. <laughs> so, uh, Thyssenkrupp. Do you know Thyssenkrupp? Have you seen? Yeah, you might have probably been in their elevators or on their travelators. They also without a doubt, have produced most of the components inside your car. And they produce electric submarines. In fact, in 10 days, I'll be in the industrial port of Kiel in northern Germany, um, helping produce tiny, tiny little electric submarines that will go out in swarms through the ocean and track what's going on and stop fishermen catching the wrong fish. Um, it's not school. It's a very different type of project. The problem is, for a company like this, that um, doing German engineering the German engineering way is to do amazing technology and amazing products, but just do it a little bit thinner, a little bit lighter, a little bit better than the year before. And it isn't enough to help a company like this survive in a world of uh, technology that moves much faster than the big engineering things that they build. So we worked with uh, Thyssenkrupp about two years ago, we began a journey to help them learn how to think differently and make ideas happen fast. 
And it's called the Innovation Garage or the Innovation Garage. <laughs> You'll hear in the voiceover. There's a voiceover man that we use from America. I don't know if he is American. It sounds almost over American, the accent. I think he's trying a bit too hard. Um, and don't think it's me. Someone thought that the other day. Who was uh, with me on Wednesday in the ESF? We did a little workshop. A couple of you have seen this clip. Uh, I kind of apologise because I'm going to ask you to look at it again. But for the rest of you, can you take the notepads if you have one or notes function on your phone? And I want you to really observe. Don't just watch the video and go, that's cute. Observe. I want you to look at every bit of pedagogy. What, what teaching things did we do to make these engineers think differently? I'll tell you one thing that you'll notice. There are lots of men. That's your first problem in engineering. Lots of men. We had to really seek out one woman engineer. So I, I, I make no apologies because it's not my company. But when you only have men in engineering teams, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it's just a tussling of egos. Um, and that was a big thing we wanted to break down. And in German engineering uh, companies, you tend to call people not only by their surname, but you also mention every doctorate that they have. So it's her, Dr. Dr. Schmidt. You know, so we had to get them using first names, for example. Uh, we didn't want them in suits and ties, so we had to send them a Google image search result for smart casual <laughs> so, so that they could turn up. They all came in beautifully, beautifully pressed jeans. I've never seen jeans pressed. <laughs> but German engineers obviously have trouser presses in their closets. So watch this clip and just want you to look at everything else that we constructed to help these people change mind shift, uh, change mindset, sorry, and uh, create, uh, well, actually not create ideas, find problems, find new problems in the automotive sector in this world of automated driving. Okay, here we go. How does innovation happen? How can we create ideas that really matter? And what makes a good innovator? Innovation Garage, this for the innovators. I told you he's not American. Um, <laughs> now some of you have forgotten the task already. You're sat there cross-armed, waiting to be entertained. Get to work, please. Pencil. Pen, notepad, something with which to write. Look interested and busy. The photographer will stand up and start taking photos of those who are not doing the task. She is under strict instructions. Please look uh, alert for this, all right? It's a very short video, two minutes, 54. Can you concentrate that long? Here we go. We've brought together a programme of techniques, strategies and above all time, just precious time for teams to do the kind of thinking that otherwise there's no time for in normal day-to-day -day business. Here in Module 1 the teams will shape their problem. They started off with a challenge and through the first module they will dive deep into it and they will shape the problem until they have one that they are satisfied with. One of the things that we are going to do with the teams is to actually ask them to leave the building and leave their desks and move out into the city, explore different forms of mobility, but even more so talk with people who experience mobility and the pains that relate to the challenges that the teams have. It's not easy to bring customers into a conversation all the time. It can be complex, uh, long-winded processes, but it's really fundamentally important that we do it to build products and services of tomorrow.
motivation is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. It's hard work. I totally like the startup spirit of this workshop. Uh, it was an amazing atmosphere. Everybody was really open-minded and relaxed. And I thought it was a creative setting we worked in. So it was fun. After this workshop, teams collaborate for four weeks to really hone in on the right problem. And next time, they're going to solve those problems. Right, so really quickly, what kinds of things did you notice? Shout nice and loudly, teach your voices, no hands up, okay? Everybody's white. Everyone's, yeah. Everyone is white. That, that's because um, they're all engineers, they're also male, and they live in Germany. Uh, you asked to look at the problem from the end user. Yeah, look at it from the end user. These guys never speak to people who drive cars. If you go to a German Berlin taxi driver and tell him all cars will be automated in 10 years, the taxi driver uh, tends to have a say about it. <laughs> what else? No, well, there's no technology to end with either. There's no technology because technology just gets in the way, actually, of being able to think. Technology is a great way to posture. It's a great way to, to block people out. Just the, part, just the laptop screen shell is enough to stop a conversation. How did we get people having a conversation? So you want to get uh, engaged into a problem, not just for one person, but you want to engage into a problem that everyone believes in. So Everyone gets passionate about a problem. It's too easy to get passionate about an idea and you're solving the wrong problem. And geeks do that really well. They pick the wrong problem and then spend years trying to solve it. Other things, no hands up, you just shout, shout out. Happy days of time to think. Time to think. You have to become a bartender and everyone knows about it. You saw the campfire, yes. We brought heroes from within the company. We showed them innovators are here and now. Um, Mari, who you saw there, ran a business unit. Um, secretly for four years. No one knew it. He was told to shut it down. He kept it going and turned it into the most profitable business unit in the elevator business. Did we take them outside of their comfort zone? Yeah. How did we take them out of their comfort zone? Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Hands up. No. <laughs> How did we take them out of their comfort zone? Yeah. We took them away from their cubicle. Took away their ties. Put on some jeans. Found nice shirts. What else? Humor. The first thing, I showed this video um, uh, back at the International Baccalaureate Conference. I was trying to show the International Baccalaureate that maybe breaking rules was a good idea. <laughs> no, one from the, no one from the IB was actually at their own conference, so. <laughs> Are we recording this and streaming it? <laughs> so, <laughs> stuff it. Um, laughter was the first thing that someone said. It tells you a lot when the first thing someone says is, they were laughing. Um, what else? Celebration. Celebration of what? Success. Celebration of sharing. There's no success because they've not built anything yet. So it's just a, a celebration of, wow, you found a good problem. Three or four more things that you've spotted. Different seating. Yeah. The interesting thing is, Frauke Jensen, Frauke Jensen, who you saw at the end, was a trainee at the time. She'd only been in the company for a few months. She emerged as a natural leader in her team. Um, she didn't earn it, didn't get investment for the idea they came up with in the end, but she is now a sort of hero innovator within the elevator unit in Spain. So um, the process for her meant that she was able to overcome all this usual hierarchical nonsense that's in companies sometimes. One more thing. You hear first? Beer, yeah. I think both of you shouted beer. Um, you're right. Beer's kind of important. <laughs> we knew this. <laughs> Justin, I thought this was an innovation conference. There, nothing new there. So, lots of yellow color. That, and what's interesting is even the space we semi-constructed. This is uh, or deconstructed. It's called Beta House. A Beta House. It's 
partially there. So you break it up and you make it what you want. And um, this is in Berlin, in a really funky part of the city called Kreuzberg. So um, taking them into this environment, flattening those hierarchies, introducing smiles into what is generally really tough work means that you can do so much. The other thing that we introduced, though, was this notion, and you picked up on it, that defining the problem is more important than solving it. And um, that is the core skill, really, if you're trying to get um, young people prepared for their future. I said already, the people, the, the ideas that will impact our future are already being shaped today. Not the ideas themselves, but pe the problems. And so problem shaping and problem finding, um, I've been banging on about this for nine years now, but it's maybe the most important thing for young people to learn how to do. And we don't do it particularly well in curriculum-driven things because we package up the recipe we want students to learn about. We tell them what the problem is, we define it at 11 o'clock at night in our bedroom. That's where I did my planning when I was teaching. Um, we show it to them the next day and we drive them in 53 minutes to solve it. First school I taught in every lesson was 53 minutes. This is a page in, from the Google website that you may not ever have visited. It's the About page of Google. I bet you didn't even know they had an About page. Um, and the very last line on it, the very last one of their 10 operating principles is this. It's the idea that ultimately our constant dissatisfaction with the way things are becomes the driving force behind everything we do. Now, they're a client of ours, and this is really hard. It means that my colleague uh, Simon and I, who, who Simon's over here, uh, we've been here in Hong Kong. Next week, we're working with uh, Google. Um, we've created a, a, a ridiculous experience for educators to think differently. And uh, with day's notice, we ditched about um, seven weeks worth of work and in three days we're replacing it with something that's going to be better and it's infuriating and it's frustrating but it's for the good of the idea we have to do that and in school again think about how we draft and redraft when was the last time that student work got turned in after a bunch of effort and you said no this isn't really working is it i think you should go back and do it again totally differently we tend not to do that because of all sorts of things. Is, is a student capable? Are we going to hurt feelings? Why did we not spot this earlier? Could we not have um, done a, a, what we call a pre-mortem and discover how this project is going to die before it dies? At Burberry, the same thing is true. When we were working with Burberry on a design thinking program, this program was pretty revolutionary. It took long-term unemployed young people young people who've not had a job for nine months or more. The chances of getting into employment after that period of time are very slim. And in six weeks of thinking differently and learning how to think differently, over 90% ended up in full-time employment for longer than a year. And we ran this in Shanghai, Hong Kong. Uh, we ran it in London, Castleford, where they still make the trench coats. And if you find an old trench coat in an op shop, buy it because you can post it back to Burberry and they'll repair it for free and send it back to you and then you can sell it for a grand. Um, <laughs> we did it in New York and Chicago. Same result every time. One of the things that, that we were able to do though was harness the workforce. And this gentleman is the man who designs the jeans. And for me, jeans is jeans. So, some of you are disagreeing, I think, that, you know, don't lecture me on it. He did. He said, no, jeans are not jeans. We design jeans afresh, twice a year, two seasons a year. And I just couldn't get my head around how he knows what kind of jeans we want to wear in 18 months from now, and then makes a big enough point of difference that we want to buy them. And remember, Burberry jeans are, they are about $550 a pair. It's quite a lot of money to spend in jeans. It says the Scottish guy wearing Gap. Um, <laughs> what makes a great jean? I, 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 couldn't I couldn't answer the question myself, and it was really hard for him to explain, but he knew it, and he did it relentlessly. Or this woman, you may not know, Carol White. Carol White's a creative hero of mine. And in the most unlikely circumstances, she founded the Premier Model Agency when she realized that she was a terrible model. 
And she said, I'm, rather than being pushed around by all these kind of gross, <laughs> fat men uh, who run modeling agencies, I'm going to create a modeling agency that does things differently. Here, she and her brother got together, founded Premier, and within a couple of years, she had invented the whole concept of the supermodel. And she had all these supermodels, all the ones in George Michael's video. <laughs> yeah, she, they were hers. She had an eye for it. And I've been asking myself, how do you know that someone is a supermodel? Because the whole point is it's not conventional beauty. It's, it's something else. It's a feeling. And what these people all have in common is that they do not operate in a world of mystery. We might look at it from the outside and think, wow, it's mysterious, I wonder how they do that. They don't operate in mystery. They all operate definitely in the land of heuristics. This is from Roger Martin's design thinking work at the, the Rotman School of Management in Toronto. Heuristics is what we might call gut feel. So you know great teachers when you see them, they tend to have a good gut for when they're going to change their plan and when, the, when they, they're going to follow their plan, when they're going to speed up, slow down. And then when you speak to them and um, say, I'm going to give you a new teacher, new service teacher, and I want you to mentor them, they turn out to be terrible mentors because they can't explain how they're doing what they do. And yet you might have a teacher who's quite straight and narrow, verging on mediocre, shall we say, but they're really good at explaining to a new service teacher how to be a brilliant teacher, and the teacher benefits from it. And that's because they've got an algorithmic understanding of what it takes uh, to not have children throw seats around the classroom, uh, not jump out the window, and generally stay alive and learn something in your class. I realize none of this resonates with you. That's the kind of school I taught in, where these things were kind of essential survival in the classroom before you could teach them French. I ended up with an algorithmic understanding of what it took to manage a group of 32 big boys and girls who did not want to be there. And I had a good heuristic, once I'd nailed that classroom management, I had good gut feel for what kinds of things I could get away with in a classroom. When I had boys only classes teaching them French, I had an algorithmic understanding of how to make them smile and love learning this language and how to go all schmoozy and ho ho ho. <laughs> and um, when I taught senior students who really wanted to learn French for the first time, I was in a total land of mystery because I'd never had it before and I didn't know how to cope with it. And I was a terrible teacher um, for those poor students for about three months. I, I just didn't know how to, you know, what you want to learn, gosh. Um, so where do you operate mostly? You probably operate in heuristics. You chose to be here, I guess. You're great teachers. You're trying to learn new things all the time. Those of you teaching someone over the conference will have an algorithmic understanding of what you're sharing because you've had to really think about how you're sharing this so other people can copy it and, and emulate it. The creative people we work with tend to be really algorithmic in not maybe, um, not just in their day-to-day -day work, but in how they get other people inspired around them. And that's something worth uh, considering. How can you take what you think is great practice and make it algorithmically copyable, pasteable, reusable? And when exactly are you going to do that? Most of your time for that kind of development work happens to be in your vacations. I'm pretty sure of it. That's when the, the dots start to join up. And the rule-breaking side, where does that come in? You can't really break rules very easily unless you have an understanding algorithmically of what you're trying to achieve. So if you're operating in a land of mystery, you don't even know you're breaking a rule when you break it. If you're operating in heuristics, you can break a rule, but other people in your team don't understand why you're breaking the rule. A good example would be in workshops this week. I was changing the plan quite significantly in some cases based on what I was seeing in front of me on the fly. And my colleague Simon, who hadn't seen some of these workshops before, had to work out for himself, um, why, is, why is that going on? And sometimes it wasn't clear till after the fact when I was able to explain algorithmically, this is why I had to do it. So how can you get to that point and why is it important? Well, there are three algorithmic things really solid things that 
all the top educators, top schools, and the top creative and industrial companies do. And I want to share them with you briefly before we wrap up. Three things. They know their why. They know why they're doing something. They are provocative, generally. They, they grab your attention and surprise you with what they're trying to do. And they have a process in which they trust. It might look like they're operating on the fly, but they really are not. They have a rock-solid algorithmic process that they trust when projects get tough. Now, I'm going to, um, I'm going to try to explain these briefly uh, in, a, in just a couple of minutes. And then I think that many of these are things that you're going to be exploring in workshops and other talks through the rest of this event. And so maybe you can bear these in mind. Are you being shown how to encapsulate a why? Are you being shown how to be provocative without annoying people, but rather to make them think differently? Or are you being shown a process that <clears throat> you could use in order to have some more open thinking, more divergent thinking? Knowing your why in school, uh, particularly in projects, is often tough. When you go visiting schools um, as a, an outside person, one of the things you hear outsiders often say to kids is, what is it you're doing? What, and it's, it's quite possibly the most useless question. The, the correct answer is, use your eyes. Listen a bit. The really important question to ask instead of, uh, what is it you're doing? is maybe why are you doing it? Why are you doing this? I would love to challenge you all to do that next week in school. Pick 10 kids over the course of the week and just ask them, why are you learning what you're learning? And see how quickly they're able to answer you. A good story, I mean, it's an old one, um, and I've told it many times before, but we worked with um, primary school kids in, in uh, Sunderland in the United Kingdom who created what is still the youngest ever TEDx event ever run. It was run by six and seven year olds and they all developed their own talks, um, developed their own projects. Their talk titles were brilliant. You know, do animals talk? Which cancer should we invest in curing first? Why do slugs need slime? Really interesting answer to that one. One type of slug needs slime in order to mate with other slugs. And another type of slug needs the slime so it can find its prey. You don't want to get mixed up, do you? <laughs> why do people need to get sick and why is vomiting so important? And uh, they all had what we call a star moment, something they'll always remember. Her star moment was constructing vomit on stage and throwing it at the speed. <laughs> Projectile vomit is 90 miles an hour. And she showed this with a, you know, carrot-filled Tupperware that her mother had given her with some liquid and, you know, visible solids um, and threw it into the front of the, the room. They remembered the talk. So great talks, but what was the why behind this? Um, the teachers were convinced that the why was to do the TED Talks. Oh, that's great, we're doing a TEDx. They kept talking about doing the TEDx and I kept having to remind them that's not the why, that's just a what. The why behind this, the reason they got in touch with us, was because they felt that their students were struggling with writing and speaking. So we could have done anything, but writing and speaking is really the why. We want to improve the writing and speaking to the point that they feel they can write and they can speak. And we use things like video game um, uh, opening screens, these beautiful, rich graphic animations, and gave them manageable tasks. So write the best story you've ever written ever, you've got 20 minutes to write it and you're only allowed two sentences. And these children who I was told can't write would write things like, you know, in an ancient horrifying castle on a mysterious hill, in a bubbly pitch black sky, I chopped down like a prickly skeleton bone and I can hear the dinos roar. The gruesome castle laid in a horrifying planet, trees looking like ghouls' hands emerged out of the volcanic ground. They can't write, absolute twaddle. Of course they can write, but the context was wrong because we had lost sight of the why during the course of the school year. The why of writing had become something like, you know, we need to do an hour of writing and reading every day. Nonsense. The why is learning how to write to tell stories that you can be proud of. We had a process. 
We used writer's process, writer's workshop type things that you do. We used post-it notes for storyboarding. We got them to talk through what they thought their talk would be. We gave them the book Resonate by Nancy Duarte and said, learn from a pro how to tell great stories. Make a little um, graphic book so that you can walk through your story without reading any words at all and tell it in a more fluent manner. Provocation, I've said, is important. And for provocation, and in advertising is a really good way to look at provocation. Great adverts tend to slap you around the face a little bit. Um, but you can provoke in school as well when you um, give students projects that are a little bit more challenging to them. Projects that might feel like they're breaking the rules. I mean, is it okay to mobilize people by stretching the truth a little bit? So it's okay to do that? Not really, not all the time. Depends. Depends where you are, who you are, what you're trying to achieve. Depends whether what you're doing is seen as good or not. Your music's just noise, isn't it? Tell that to a 14 year old, it's a provocation. An iPad doesn't really know what it is, just gets mathematicians in a fuddle. They, they don't like that one. Of course an iPad knows what it is, maths inside it, but is maths really the iPad? The first five days of school are broken. We give that one to people on the inset day, the professional development day of the first day of school. And they're one day, 12 hours away from these kids coming in and we say, your first five days of school are just nonsense, aren't they? Lots of filling in covers of jotters, playing silly games, and then the real work begins. The earth is full, evacuate. <laughs> that resonates here. Every speck of dust tells a story. That's that grade three topic. Any grade three teachers here? Yep, rocks and soils. Why do you teach that nonsense? I know you maybe don't, but lots of people do. Rocks and soils is a project that every kid in England at some point is subjected to. And the teachers decided that actually it's, it's more about astrophysics rather than rocks and soils. So they made this project to show that we're all made from stardust and work back from there to teach kids about what's under their feet. Now listen, unbelievably, we're out of time. And I want to send you off with um, those three things ringing in your ears. I want you to consider two things. First of all, there are things you know you know. And there are things you know you don't know. And you could be tempted to go to workshops that fill you up a little bit more with things you know you don't know. But there's a whole bunch of unknown unknowns in this event. Things that you look at and you go, hmm, that doesn't really interest me. How do you know? It's an unknown unknown and there are so many unknown unknowns that what you know you know is reduced to a speck of dust. So what I would encourage you to do is overcome what we call the knowledge barrier. You can't go through the knowledge barrier to discover unknown unknowns. You bump into unknown unknowns by going round this side, by accidentally bumping into someone who you've never met before and asking them, you know, what is it you do? And can you tell me something that maybe I didn't know? Attempt, if you can, to find those unknown unknowns and get beyond what you think you're confident in. That's the purpose of these kinds of events. Anything that you know about a little bit and you know you don't know X, Y, or Z, use Google, find out for yourself later. I would use an event like this to go and see things that I wouldn't even know what question to ask Google because that's where you'll have the most exciting learning over these next two days. And most important of all, don't sit and listen too much. Uh, get in your pins, walk around. We, tell, we always say less typing and griping, so don't just write notes for yourself. More walking and talking. When you leave a session, find someone and ask them, what did you get out of that session? And when you're asked the question, even if you got nothing out of it, dig deep. <laughs> you can hear the desperation in my voice now. Dig deep. <laughs> find, find one thing that you got out of it and tell that person. And I can guarantee you it will be different from what they got out of the, of the same session if they had been in it. And that way, it's more than just the crazy number of presenters sharing their thing. Every one of us becomes a presenter, able to share something, teach something new to an old dog. 
Thank you so much for coming to the event. Thank you, Justin, for the invitation. And we'll see you through the morning. Thank you. Thank you.